Greetings Physics 211. Um, this is the lecture for Friday, February 24th. This is the day that uh, we had to cancel because of the uh, Jazz Festival uh, who was taking our classroom. So um, thanks everybody for tuning in uh, that is to the lecture. Um, today we're going to be covering chapter, starting in on chapter 6 and your homework for chapter five about uh, forces was due, well, it's due at 10.30 on Friday, uh, normal class start time. Uh, hopefully everyone got that done. Uh, it was a pretty hard one. So uh, if you have questions or anything, uh, always feel free to ask the TAs or ask me or use ask, your, um, ask a question, ask your teacher on uh, WebAssign. Uh, I thought I'd start by covering a little bit about uh, the test, which is now finally graded, thanks for the uh, work that the TAs did on that. Um, the, uh, so, um, as I expected, uh, the, the mean on the test was uh, fairly low. Uh, if you look at it in an, uh, a high school like, you know, 90 uh, to 100 is an A, 80 is a 90 is a B kind of thing. Um, of course, I don't look at it that way, so I'm not intimidated by the numbers. Uh, the average on the test, uh, was a 61, uh, and the standard deviation was uh, 20, a little over 20. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what these mean, these refer to um, the scientific uh, characterization of, or the mathematical statistical characterization of the distribution of scores. So this assumes that you have a, a, a bell curve uh, and effectively a, a Gaussian curve and the mean um, is, if, if it were a Gaussian, the mean would correspond to the middle of the curve and the standard deviation, which we call the Greek letter sigma, would be the half size of the, of, uh, the width, the distribution. Um, the, so what I did was I took these numbers and to assign the curved grades, um, I assumed I curved these into as if it were uh, the same bell curve centered around 80, so curved around to B minus uh, with a standard deviation of 10. So you might write that 80 plus or minus 10. Uh, what that means is that uh, if you uh, once we go into this new system uh, after the curve, uh, I do this curve for you, not for me. Uh, the curve puts it, uh, your grades into the same conventional 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B, 70 to 80 is a C, uh, 60 to 70 is a D, and lower than 60 is an F uh, kind of range. Um, I can tell you the distribution of scores that we had. We had 16% um, uh, got A's. Uh, we had 39% get B's. 27% uh, of the class had C's. Uh, let's see, 14% of the class got a D, and we had 5% fail. Uh, if you didn't do as well as you'd hoped, there's hope. Remember, uh, you can always retake an exam at the end of the semester, and you may choose, you may elect at that time to retake this exam, uh, in which case your present score goes away. Uh, and it will be replaced by your score that you get on the new score if it's better. If you do worse, then it can't hurt you. So the new score will, will disappear if you do worse. Um, of course, it's not the exact same exam, guys, um, uh, obviously. Uh, so I will, the, the test will be suitably altered, but um, it will be a new test, but it will cover the same material. Um, notice the, you know, if you're astute here, the fact that it is not symmetric around um, the B minus that I'm curving it around means that we, of course, did not have a, a, a distribution that looks like this. The distribution is a little bit skewed toward um, the B range, which we had more than half the people got A's and B's uh, on the exam. Uh, and, of course, the ones that, d that didn't do as well, remember, you, as I said, you can always retake it. So uh, I hope that you avail yourself of that opportunity if you didn't do as well as you'd hope to. Um, but this... Uh, this kind of score, this uh, kind of average 61 is right what I was uh, aiming for. Uh, it's very in line with what I've had on uh, previous times I've taught the course, so that's um, pretty much par for the course. I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, and that's kind of what all the exams are going to look like. 
Um, I have said people that are uh, not quite sure what the overall grading scheme is, once I've curved your exam into this, uh, your, your familiar um, high school grading system, uh, it's going to look like what you're familiar with. The homework grades um, are probably ultimately going to receive some kind of a curve as well. Um, I can't decide what that is. Uh, I won't decide what that is until uh, the end of the course. Um, and so, but it's not going to hurt you. I'm not going to curve uh, your grades down. Um, so whatever grade you get showing up in WebAssign is going to be sort of a minimum uh, grade that you might expect. Uh, it can always be higher, um, but I'm not mean enough to make it lower. My dad tells me a story about a uh, class he took where the exams were super easy and the average was like a 96 or something um, out of 100. And so uh, the professor curved it around it just like this. So if you got 96 to a 98, that was a B, and 98 to 100 was, a, was an A, and 94 to 96 was a C, and I'm not that mean, so I'm not going to uh, curve you guys down. But I will consider curving the homework grades up uh, to make sure that uh, I think I get the distribution uh, um, of grades that's, that's fair and appropriate by the end. Okay, uh, so we're going to start in on Chapter 6, which are some interesting applications of uh, the force laws that you all learned in Chapter 5 that we've been going over on the last week. Uh, and so Chapter 6 here, uh, the first lecture in Chapter 6 here is going to be about uh, circular motion force. So, uh, right, we learned about circular motion uh, back uh, in chapter four, it must have been, where we decided that, uh, right, if you are moving in a circle in a, at a constant speed, then you must be uh, uh, having a centripetal acceleration, so an acceleration toward the center um, of that circle that's equal to v squared over r, where v squared is the velocity and r is the radius of the circle if you're in constant speed motion. Uh, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, what might happen if you have uh, cir similar circular motion, but we're going to now talk about it in the context um, of forces, and so we can get a little, um, have, you know, start looking at a little more interesting cases. Uh, so uh, let's say you have uh, a cup of water, and you're going to uh, hold it you know, at the end of your arm, say, but it kind of looks like it's going to be on a string. I'm going to put it like that. Uh, and you're going to spin that cup of water around in a circle vertically. So this is uh, a case where this direction is down and this is up. So you're in a gravitational field. So clearly, um, if uh, you spin this very slowly, you are going to leak all this water all over the floor. Uh, and so I recommend that you not do this experiment um, unless you're in the bathtub or unless you spin yourself really fast. How fast do you have to spin it? Well, let's think about this problem uh, from a force point of view. Um, and whenever you're going to think, of a, think about a problem in terms of forces, we've drawn a, drawn a picture. That's the first step. The specific kind of picture that we need, though, in this particular case is going to always be a free body diagram. So let's look at the free body diagram uh, of the cup of water in this case. Uh, when it's at the bottom like that, you've got a cup of water. What forces are acting on the water? Well, there's gravity. And we know that force is going to be equal to mg. There's also, in this case, um, a centripetal force pulling inward. Uh, and that centripetal force is, you know, the action on the string or on your arm here that's pulling it uh, to ensure that it continues going in a circle. So F centripetal. And in this case, that centripetal force uh, is going to be equal to V squared over R, right, where R is the radius and V is how fast you're, you're moving this thing in a constant speed around the circle. Okay. Um, that's great. So clearly, uh, this net force that you're getting uh, from gravity is not contributing to the centripetal force, right? Uh, the, the gravity and the centripetal force are going in opposite directions, so they are not um, 
contributing it to it together. Uh, in which case, because um, ultimately this, this centripetal force is deriving from um, the force, uh, uh, normal force, right, uh, as you get the electrical forces in the cup of water, <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, are going to be pushing up on it. Um, ultimately, uh, these aren't all the forces then in the problem, right? There's also the normal force. And in this case, the magnitude of the normal force, because uh, this object is uh, not, I mean, it's, it's moving around in a circle, it's accelerating inward um, a bit, but the net force on this guy uh, is going to be such that it's a little bit, it's going to be inward, right? There's a net force inward, and so the net normal force needs to make sure that it accounts for both gravity and this ad additional amount of centripetal uh, acceleration, centripetal force that pulls it toward the toward, toward uh, pulls it inward. So in this case, the normal force pushing on the cup uh, must be equal to the sum of these two, right? The f normal force at the bottom, as you're sw sweeping sweeping this thing around, must be equal to v squared over r plus mg, or I'm sorry, right, sorry, this is a force, uh, it must be mv squared over r plus mg. Okay, great. So definitely uh, no reason to think that that water is going to fall out of the cup at the bottom, no matter which way you go, uh, that wouldn't make any sense. Once you get up, say, to the side here, now we're in a different case. Uh, let's do another free body diagram uh, of the water uh, when it's on its side. At this position, we have a force of gravity, which is now pushing sort of sideways in the cup. It's still equal to mg. We still need a centripetal force uh, that's going to be equal to mv squared over r, ma, and a is v squared over r. Uh, and so in this case, um, the normal force must be providing that centripetal acceleration, uh, that centripetal force, right? Uh, it's, once again, the, those electrical forces uh, of the cup pushing up on the water uh, and ultimately pull, uh, held by your hand, holding it in that circular uh, motion that's keeping this guy um, in its circular, circular motion uh, and is providing that centripetal acceleration. So this is also the normal force in this case. This is what we know the net acceleration must be. Uh, and so there must be that normal force providing that centripetal acceleration. Uh, in this case, that normal force needs to be equal to the centripetal uh, force there, mv squared over r. Uh, of course, the gravity is pulling down on the water, so the water is going to actually, you know, uh, this is. Uh, I drew the water as straight, but it's actually going to start looking something like this because well, gravity is going to be pulling it down. But uh, there's still a force, that normal force, holding it in place that's going to prevent it from spilling out so long as you're spinning fast enough. Um, how fast you need to spin is going to depend on angles and such like that. We're not going to go into that for this case on the side, uh, but we will look at how fast you need to spin it when uh, you're at the top. So let's do that now. Uh, you got a cup of water here at the top. Clearly, uh, you know, if you're spinning it fast enough, that water is going to stay in place. And if you're not spinning it fast enough, that water is going to spill uh, and make a huge mess. You hope it's water. Um, otherwise, if it's st something sticky, it's going to be a big mop problem. So let's look at a free body diagram of what uh, that water looks like and how fast then you'd have to spin it uh, in order to prevent it from spilling out. So here's a cup of water. Sorry, there we go. Okay, uh, so let's do our free body diagram on the water at the top of its arc. Uh, once again, we have a force due to gravity equal to mg. There must also be the net force, right? The sum of the forces on this guy must be equal to um, enough to be able to at least 
pull this thing uh, in a centripetal uh, way such that it's going to be able to maintain its, its circular motion. So we know that there uh, must be the net force here is going to need to be equal to that centripetal force at least which is equal to mv squared over r. Now, this centripetal force could be greater. Okay, that's fine. But uh, if you think about it, right, right, if you're just spinning it just fast enough so it's just barely staying in the cup, it's technically sort of in, you know, free fall at the top here, but uh, as long as the cup is moving fast enough inward, it's not going to actually spill. So let's look at that case then when these are equal. So the threshold case, when you're just barely at the top, just barely spinning it fast enough um, in order for that uh, water to not spill out. In that case, the gravitational force must be equal to the centripetal force, holding it in place. Uh, so let's go ahead and calculate that out. The force of gravity is equal to mg. The centripetal force is equal to m v squared over r. So this isn't too big a surprise in this case. Um, because uh, it doesn't actually matter how much water is in the cup or if you, how, if you treat a very small portion of the water or if you look at all the water together, eh, it doesn't matter, nobody cares because this mass is going to cancel out of both sides. How fast would you have to spin it? Well, V squared is going to have to be equal to R times G or solving this for V here, V would have to be equal to the square root of R times G in order for you to be spinning this thing fast enough just barely fast enough so it's not going to fall out. Uh, so the, the units work out on this. This is meters per second squared and this is meters. So under the square root is going to be a meter squared divided by second squared. You take the square root, you get, should get meters per second. So that looks good. Um, let's take a, you know, a candidate case here uh, and calculate a typical speed. Say you're using your arm and you have a, a water or a soda or something and you are spin it around. Um, in that case, uh, you know, next time you're in the shower, Please take the opportunity to, uh, to do this. Take a cup of water, start spinning your arm around, and see how fast you have to spin it before it stops spilling out. Uh, let's calculate how fast it should be. I think it should be, that velocity should be equal to the square root of, uh, what's the radius of your arm? Yeah, it's like a meter. One meter times 9.81 meters per second squared, square rooted. Um, that's the square root of... 10. Uh, what's the square root of 10? It's about pi, so it's like 3.1 or something. I can't check it because I'm using my phone to do the recording here, so we'll have to do, uh, we'll have to rely on uh, on the fly math here, but it should be a little over 3, so we'll call it 3.2 meters per second. Probably should have done it with just one sig fig. That way it will come out three and I wouldn't have to worry about it. So three meters per second. Um, and, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the total circumference of this circle that you're spinning it around is going to be equal to two pi times the length of your arm. If the length of your arm is one, right? Circumference. If the length of your arm is one, that's going to be 6.28 meters all the way around, which is... Uh, about double this. So uh, you, if you're basically spinning your arm around once every two seconds, that should be barely fast enough to hold this in, I think. So you should do this experiment um, and see. Of course, if um, <coughs> if your uh, arm is longer, then you'll have to move faster uh, in absolute speed. Uh, in order for to, to maintain uh, uh, the same centripetal acceleration. If your arm is small, is shorter, your this actual speed at which you'll have to rotate uh, will be faster, though the, the number of revolutions per second would have to be a little bit more. Um, so do this experiment, see how far off I am, and um, see, if, see if you believe uh, all this physics I'm teaching you uh, is right, or if you think it's, uh, it's all bogus. You should be able to at least do this test and see what you think. Okay, um, that's how fast you have to spin it. Um, let's look at um, the t 
total tension you'd have to have in the, you know, if this were a string, of course it isn't, uh, if it's your arm, it's not a string, uh, or how hard you have to pull on it. Um, looking at that total tension, <coughs> uh, you're going to have to, it's going to be a little bit different depending on uh, whether you're at the bottom or the top, right? Uh, if you're at the top, uh, the total tension, the total uh, net force uh, is probably going to be zero because gravity is doing all the pulling. Um, and gravity is corresponding to all the centripetal force. At the bottom, on the other hand, the string has to hold not only the gravity, but it also has to hold uh, to provide the centripetal force as well. So it's going to be, uh, if you're spinning it right at this critical level, you know that that's going to be twice mg. So it's essentially going to be two gravities at the bottom and zero gravity at the very top. Uh, just as you're flying through the through the through the top part, if you're right at the very edge, if you're going faster, of course, um, then you'll have a greater number of g's here. But the difference between uh, these two is always going to be those two g's because either gravity is with you, um, in which case it's helping helping provide that centripetal uh, acceleration, or it's against you, in which case uh, you have to provide additional the centripetal acceleration and you have to pull against gravity at the same time. Okay. Okay, so let's look at a little uh, more complicated uh, circular motion problem. Uh, so that way we're sort of looking at a two-dimensional problem. Uh, we could also look at uh, effectively a three-dimensional uh, three centripetal motion problem. Not that that wasn't, couldn't have been in three dimensions, but we're only looking at, at two of them. So let's uh, imagine a different problem you had. Let's say instead of uh, spinning, taking a, that mass on the end of uh, your string and spinning it vertically, let's take it instead, uh, mass at the end of a, of a string here, and instead we're going to turn it in a horizontal circle. Although this, uh, we're going to hold the string above that horizontal circle that it's being rotated in, uh, and it's going to be held uh, up uh, still at some length, say the length of the string here is L, and we're going to turn it at some vertical angle, theta. Okay, so we're going to have to, say we're rotating it around there. Uh, in this case, if we're going to rotate it at a constant velocity, like we've always claimed, we're going to need to figure out um, exactly uh, what the behavior uh, of this guy is and what the forces are on it uh, as a function of time. So we've drawn a picture. Since it's a force problem, what kind of picture do we need? A free body diagram. So let's do a free body diagram on this thing. Okay, what are the forces on it? Force of gravity which should be equal to mg. The only other force on this is tension in the string. So there's some force of tension in the string. Uh, so these are the two forces on the ball as it's rotating around in this horizontal uh, circle, flat plane circle. All right, um, that's great. How does that uh, tell us anything? Well, we know that um, from Newton's second law, right, the sum of the forces, the net force, needs to be equal to ma. So the net forces here, let's use these as vectors, the net forces <coughs> are going to be equal to tension minus mgj hat. Okay, great. Um, that's nice and all. Uh, how does this help us? Well, uh, we know what this net force must be equal to. If 
this body is in simple circular motion. If we were to ignore gravity, right? If you're just thinking about it as a, something to turn around in a, uh, in a circle on a piece of paper, uh, we know that the net force, uh, we know what the net force must be. It must be equal to the centripetal acceleration, mv squared over r, and that's going to be in the negative uh, r hat direction if we uh, take r hat going this way where r is then the radius of this circle, which we don't actually know yet. But we should be able to calculate it from this. Okay, so we know that this is the net force. And we know this is the total force. This must be what the total, this is what the sum of the forces are on the body, as calculated from our free body diagram here. And this is what the sum of the forces are, must equal to. Let's set those equal to one another uh, and solve and see, how, see what essentially, how, what this radius is, how uh, big the circle has to be as a function of how fast we're swinging it. So uh, we set these equal to each other, in which case the tension minus mgj hat is going to be equal to um, negative mv squared over r in r hat. Well, um, I can tell you something right now. Uh, this is a vector equation, right? Uh, and in this case, we're only really looking at two dimensions, the r hat dimension and the j hat dimension. Uh, we're not looking at any forces in the tangential direction, so we're not going to worry about that, the theta hat direction. Because this is a vector equation, uh, in this case, it's a vector equation in two dimensions. Therefore, it's got it's actually two equations. So let's split this up into its individual component equations. In that case, right, uh, we have the J component, the vertical component of tension minus M G J hat must be equal to negative M V squared over R hat. This is an R hat. That's totally not in the same direction. This is, must be equal to zero. Okay, we're getting somewhere. In this case, the tension in the j-hat direction must be equal to mg. In this case, going up to our free body diagram, essentially the vertical component of the tension needs to cancel out the gravity in order for this uh, ball or this mass or whatever we have to only do uh, you know uh, execute circular motion in a horizontal plane, right? If you didn't do this, um, if they didn't balance out, then it would be accelerating upward or downward, which it's not. It's in a flat circle. So uh, the tension must be equal to mg in the j-hat component of the tension. Looking at um, our diagram up here, the j-hat component of the tension is going to be a function of this um, angle theta. So let's go ahead and convert this into theta space. Um, in this case, the j-hat component of the tension is going to be equal to, uh, this is, sorry, this is minus mg. No, it's plus, because I added that to both sides. Yep, sorry, okay. Uh, so that is going to be equal to the total magnitude of the tension times the cosine of angle theta. Uh, that makes sense, so if, cosine, if theta is zero, right, it's just hanging, then uh, obviously the total tension must be equal to the gravity in order for those forces to balance. Okay, so that's a good first step. <coughs> um, solving then um, for what that tension is, the total tension in the string is going to be equal to mg over uh, cosine theta. Okay, good. Uh, that's a good first step. So that is the j hat dimension. Let's look at the other component in r hat. In r hat, uh, remember, the rest of the equation was uh, the tension minus mgj hat equal, was equal to negative mv squared over r r hat. Coming back down here then, that uh, just looking at the r components, there's going to be an r component to the tension, and that's going to be equal to negative mv squared over r r hat. They're both r hats, so we don't. We can divide the both the r hats both out. Okay. We know though that the r component of the tension is going to be t times sine theta, right? 
So by using this angle, we can abstract out um, the, the uh, bigger picture here and figure out what's going on. So if the tension um, uh, is equal to T sine theta, and that must be equal to mv squared over r. Uh, if we define our direction is inward, we know these are both heading in the same direction. Um, just, you know, you can, if you use a negative uh, angle, you get the same answer, but we'll assume a positive angle and call those the same direction so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, in that case, um, we're making some progress here. Furthermore, we know what the tension is because we calculated it. That total tension is constrained by the gravity. So that's equal to mg over cosine theta times sine theta. Right? So that's t times sine theta. All right. Uh, interesting. All right, we're making some progress here. Uh, now we can at least cross off the masses. Uh, it doesn't matter what the mass is because the gravity is affecting both the force of the centripetal force and the gravity and uh, the gravitational force. Those masses drop, right, so we don't have to explicitly keep track of the mass. It doesn't actually matter what the mass is, uh, what um, angle uh, this thing is going to uh, end up at as a function of how fast it's going. So let's go ahead and uh, plug in one more value we know. The radius of the circle, the radius of this circle here is going to be equal to the length of the string times um, sine theta again. So let's go ahead and plug that in. Uh, in that case, the length, if we plug in that r is equal to L times sine theta. Plug that in here. I have to go to a new page. Uh, the old equation uh, we ended up with was that v squared over r was equal to g sine theta over cosine theta. And we're plugging in r equals L sine theta. We end up with v squared over L sine theta is equal to g sine theta over cosine theta. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate. Ultimately, uh, let's try to find uh, what that, uh, what the velo what, what velocity we need, say, um, in order to figure out what, um, uh, if, say we wanted to, to have that thing turning in a given uh, circle of a given radius, Say we know that this is this length is is some length l. And we want this to be some length r that we don't yet know uh, or that we do know. So you say let's set it. We want it to be one meter or something, right? Uh, in that case, let's solve for what velocity we would need uh, in order to do that. And just solve uh, both sides for v. First of all, multiply both sides by l sine theta. V squared is now equal to l times g times sine squared theta over cosine theta. Take the square root of both sides. The velocity needs to be equal to the square root of L times G over cosine theta times sine theta, right? Because that's square root of the sine squared is going to just be 1. Okay, well, great. That's a, an equation. What does it mean? Let's think about it. Um, first of all, it means that uh, if um, you want uh, a longer string, right? Uh, if, as the string gets longer here, uh, the velocity that you need to move it goes up, right? So if uh, you want this in a one meter circle, uh, the velocity actually needs to go faster if you uh, start at L. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, right? Because that velocity needs to be about the same in either case. Um, it's the angle that's changing as well, right, if, if, if L and uh, sine theta are both changing. Okay, so uh, we're not fixing R here. Uh, if you fix theta instead, the way I've done it, which is different than my notes, that's, that's on me. Uh, so if you fix theta, so you want this to be a 30 degree angle or something, right, if you hold theta fixed, then uh, the longer the, the string is, the faster you need to spin that thing and uh, basically, it needs to go as the square root. So if you have a string that's twice as long, you need to swing it 
40% uh, faster, squared 2 faster. <coughs> it's also proportional to the gravity. So uh, because the gravity was setting uh, the angle from the, from the beginning, right, um, by the vertical components needing to match. So in that case, uh, in order to get the gravity to, to offset itself, uh, you, you wouldn't have to spin this thing as fast if you're doing it on the moon, say, right? Uh, G would be smaller by a factor of 6. Uh, the velocity you'd, ha you'd, you'd have to swing it would be commensurately also smaller by a factor of the square root of 6. So, you know, yeah. two and a half times smaller or something. Uh, the function of uh, the angle theta, though, is a little bit non-trivial, right? It's a little bit tricky. Um, first of all, notice that in the case where uh, theta were, say, you set it to zero, uh, right, then this becomes a trivial answer. Uh, same thing, sine theta is zero, you don't have to spin it at all, right? If it's just sitting there, um, technically it's moving in a, a, a circle of, of size zero, uh, nothing's going on. If you set theta to 90, what happens? Well, then this equation gets very upset with you. Uh, sine of 90, of course, is one, so that's no problem. Cosine 90 is zero and that's in the denominator, and we just divide it by zero. That is impossible. What this is telling you is that it is impossible under any gravitational field where g is greater than zero for you to spin uh, this thing in a perfectly horizontal circle. There must be some component of theta uh, that's in the vertical direction in order to be able to compensate for that gravity. Remember. Um, if the gravity is pulling down uh, and the only forces on it are horizontal, there's no way that you can ever compensate and you'd never get a good answer. So that fact that the, that the, the math works out funny there and gives you an answer that comes up uh, infinity or undefined in that case is telling you something. In this case, it's telling you that that actually cannot happen. That is completely unphysical. It actually doesn't work that way. Um, and and uh, no matter how hard you try, you can't spin that thing in a perfectly horizontal, uh, flat plane in a gravitational field. How am I doing on time? Okay, I got like 12 minutes left. Let's do a couple example problems, uh, and then we'll call it a day. Um, so this uh, <clears throat> first problem I have uh, is from an old version of the book, uh, chapter 6, uh, problem 15. That is probably not the same problem. Uh, number as in the modern version of the book, but if you read through, you'll probably find uh, this same problem uh, in a different one. It should be pretty obvious. Because this problem reads, uh, Tarzan, uh, with a mass of 85 kilograms, tries to cross a river by swinging on a vine. The vine is 10 meters long, and his speed at the bottom of the swing, just as he clears the water, will be 8 meters per second, it says. Tarzan does not know that the vine has a breaking strength of 1,000 newtons. And the question is, does he make it across the river safely? All right, so let's uh, do our usual. We're going to draw a picture here. So here's a tree that's holding uh, Tarzan's vine. And here he is swinging across the river. Uh, and he's going to swing like this. And here's our river. And it says that his velocity here at the bottom is 8 meters per second. Uh, it says that the length of this vine is 10 meters long. That's a pretty long vine. <clears throat> and he says he doesn't know uh, that the, the total max tension in that line is 1,000 newtons. So the question is, does he make it across safely? Uh, how do we solve that problem? We drew a picture. It's a force problem, so what kind of picture do we need? We need a free body diagram. All right, here's our free body diagram of Tarzan. What are the forces acting on him? Well, there's the force of gravity, mg downward. Uh, we only care about uh, what the forces are on him at the very bottom here, which is good, because otherwise we'd have to like actually figure out what the how much he was speeding up as he went down. It's complicated. We don't have to deal with that. Good thing. Uh, we'll be able to figure that out, although, in Chapter 8, when we talk about conservation of energy, but that's just a preview. Okay. The other force um, uh, we know uh, must be on here is tension. So the total forces 
uh, on uh, Tarzan are going to be the gravitational force and the tension in the rope. The other thing we know is that from Newton's second law, the net force is equal to ma. In this case, that must be equal to mv squared over r, right? Because at the bottom here, Tarzan is executing circular motion. Uh, all the forces are in one direction, and the net force must be uh, in the positive j hat direction. And it must be equal to mv squared over r in order to keep him in this circular motion. Uh, so we know then that the sum of the forces is also equal to negative mg j hat plus tension, the magnitude of tension. And we know these are both in the j hat direction. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what his total tension is, and we're going to compare that to what we know is the max capable, 1,000, and we're going to see how bad uh, Tarzan, how badly off Tarzan looks. We're going to solve this for T. The total tension is going to be m v squared over r plus mg. All right, let's do that calculation. Um, he, uh, his mass, oh, sorry, I didn't write that down up here. His mass is 85 kilograms. So let's rewrite this as m v squared over r plus g to make my life a little bit easier. So it's going to be 85 kilograms times v squared, 8.0 meters per second, 8.00 in fact, meters per second, times 8.00 meters per second, divided by r, which is 10 meters, um, plus uh, 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay. Tension then is going to be 85 kilograms uh, times 64 divided by 10 is 6.4. So the total uh, acceleration he has to uh, undergo here is going to be 6.4 plus 9.81. That's going to be 16 point six or uh, six point four zero. That was 6.40, this is 9.81. So this is actually going to have to be, this is going to get gain a sig fig, right? So that was an addition. 9.81 plus 6.40, it's going to give us 16.61 meters per second squared. Multiply those together. 16.6 times 85. Oh, man, I'm going to have to do that in my head. Okay, I can do this. Uh, that's going to be 850 if it were 10. It's going to be 16, uh, sorry, 1275 if it were 15. So this is going to be like mm, 1325 or something, but that has the wrong number of sig figs, doesn't it? That's four. We only have three sig figs here. So this is going to be 1.32 ish times 10 to the 3 newtons. All right, so 1300 newtons. <clears throat> Bad news for Tarzan, uh, the max strength of that rope, uh, that vine it said, was 1,000. So according to this calculation, uh, he's going in the drink. I uh, hope there are no alligators in there, otherwise it's going to turn into a horror flick, not the kind we thought we were watching. Okay, one more quick one, and then uh, we'll let you guys go. Um, the next one says, an, uh, uh, and this number, written as number 40, but it says an 0.4 kilogram object is swung in a circular path on a string half a meter long. If its speed is 4 meters per second at the top of the circle, what is the tension in the string there? Okay, so um, here's some mass M, and that mass has a, has a mass of 0.4 kilograms, we said. And the length of this rope here is equal to string, it says, 0.5 meters. And it says the velocity is 4 meters per second. Okay, so it wants to know, the question is, what is the tension in the string? How do we solve this? Free body diagram.
All right. Hint. Basically every problem for chapter six is going to require a free body diagram. So if you're not doing one, you're probably not doing it right. Just, you know, FYI. This is going to extend the exam too. If you sniff a chapter six problem uh, or even a chapter five problem, it's probably going to need a free body diagram. You should probably have one. Okay. Uh, forces on here are gravity and tension. And once again, uh, because it's in simple, simple circular motion here, we know that the sum of forces on it from Newton's second law must be equal to ma, which we know must be equal to mv squared over r. So mv squared over r must be equal to tension plus, uh, let's see, what is that, tension plus or minus? The net uh, must be tension minus mg, right, because uh, the mg is part, is, uh, let me think about this. Um, if the tension were zero, these would need to be equal, so this must be a plus, tension plus mg. Oh, that's why I did it. That's why it's not coming out right. Duh. Okay. The tension is, of course, pulling the same direction because it's at the top of its arc. No wonder, it's, no wonder I couldn't figure it out. Okay. Duh. All right. So the tension uh, and the gravity are going in the same direction. The sum of those must be equal to mv squared over r. Uh, we wanted to find out the tension. That's what it's asking. So let's go ahead and just solve for that there. That's equal to uh, the same thing we had in the last problem, v squared over r plus g all times m. Uh, let's do the same thing we did last time and go ahead and calculate that. V is going to be 4. M, or the length uh, R in this case is 0.5 meters. <coughs> Plus 9.81 meters per second squared. That's going to be... 16 times 2, this could be 32 meters per second. Wow, that is a lot. That thing is booking around there. Okay, so 0.4 kilograms times 32 plus 9.81, 32.0 plus 9.81 is going to be 41.0. Meters per second squared uh, times 0.4 is going to be what? 16, 17-ish newtons. Kilograms uh, meters per second squared is going to be 17 newtons or so. Uh, this thing isn't very massive, but it is really going fast. Um, so the net force is going to be equal to total acceleration, which I think is 42, times 0.4. Uh, okay, so you got uh, your usual daily homework, and uh, we'll be back in class, obviously, uh, as usual, in JEB 104 on Monday at 10.30. And I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks for watching, uh, and so long for now.